Hello everyone and welcome to NPARC Spotlight. My name is Leslie and I'm from the National Biodiversity Centre at the National Parks Board. Thank you all for taking the time to join us on Zoom and YouTube this morning. Over the past 10 Saturdays, we've explored many facets of our city in nature. Our in-house experts have shared about nocturnal mammals, spiders, birds, fish, and much more. We hope you, that you have enjoyed these talks and maybe even been surprised by the biodiversity that we are lucky to share our little red dot with. We will continue to be online on Saturday morning from 10.30 to 11.30 on Zoom and the NPARCS SG YouTube channel. But if you missed any of our previous sessions, do note that you can check them out on our YouTube channel as well. Today, my colleague, Dr. Karen Toon, will guide us as we plunge into the marine seascape to witness an occurrence that many of us are unlikely to have seen firsthand. As always, here is our program. I'd like to remind those on Zoom that if you have any questions during the talk, please send them to me, Leslie, as a private message using the Zoom chat. And we'll try to address a few of them after the presentation. I'm very delighted and honored to have Dr. Karen Toon here with us today. She is devoted to safeguarding our marine life. Not only did she work on coral reef monitoring and management tools for her doctorate, she was also one of the scientists that rediscovered the Neptune's cup sponge in our coastal waters. As our director of the Coastal and Marine Branch at the National Biodiversity Centre, she leads a team that tackles issues relating to the management and conservation of Singapore's marine life. Everyone, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Karen Toon, presenting When the Seas Explode Life. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Leslie. Let me share my screen now. Uh, let's see. All right, I, I suppose everyone can hear me and can see the screen. Uh, if not, someone give a shout out to let me know. Uh, big thank you to Leslie for the introduction and a very good morning to everyone. Thank you for joining us for another session of this NPARC Spotlight series. Now in today's session, I will be sharing about a rarely observed natural phenomenon that I personally find in, uh, spectacular and completely intriguing. It's a phenomenon that, I'm sorry about that, it's a phenomenon that not many people are aware of because it occurs just over a few hours, over a few nights, and usually under the cloud of darkness and underneath the surface of the sea, so rather inaccessible to most people. Now, this phenomenon is, is what scientists call um, multi-specific or mass coral spawning, when corals of different species spawn synchronously, and it occurs on reefs all over the world, including the reefs right here in, in Singapore. You know, now, although mass coral spawning has likely occurred for tens of thousands of years, it was only first ever discovered in 1984, after the advent of recreational scuba diving, which then allowed uh, researchers, scientists to start exploring the underwater world. Now, before I move on, some of you might be wondering, what is this spawn I'm talking about, right? You know, so what is spawn? Well, Spawn actually refers to the egg and sperm that are released or deposited into the water by both uh, terrestrial and marine aquatic animals, except for mammals and reptiles. So therefore to spawn refers to the process of releasing these eggs and sperm into the water. And spawning is the act that describes the process. Now, many aquatic animals spawn include motile animals like uh, worms, crabs, and fish, but also sessile animals, animals that are attached to substrates, like corals, anemones, and oysters. Now, just one example, if you look at this photo over here, I'm just going to put it on laser so you can see it a bit better. So in this photo here, this is the Christmas Island land crab. Now, the Christmas Island land crab lives in a forest. When it's time to reproduce and spawn, usually towards the last quarter of the year, it will migrate down great distances, you know, cross roads, uh, houses, to the cliff, 
down the cliff and it will release its eggs into the water. The male does the same thing, release the sperm, and fertilization occurs in the marine environment for this crab. The young come back several months later, crawl up into the forest, and then starts a life all over again. Uh, this, what you see here in this photo, uh, where the laser pointer is, that's the arched body of a cushion star. It's uh, related to your sea star family. And this fella was spotted spawning only once. Uh, I think it was in 2009 when I saw this spawning. Um, around 3 or 4 p.m. when it releases sperm and egg into the water. This photo here, what you see here, this little white thing is actually the eggs, and they're quite large, they're probably about uh, two, two centimeters or three centimeters, eggs of the cuttlefish, and it was laying within these uh, coral, folios corals. Uh, I actually saw it happen, so the, the fellow didn't like me being there, but you know, once it's committed to lay, it will lay, so he started laying these eggs within these crevices. This photo here, it's actually a metal rod, a metal rod that we, uh, Put on a reef when we do our surveys when we go back to the area we can uh, relocate the site over again and you see the fuzzy things on the metal rod that's actually the eggs of fish that was deposited on the metal rod the male probably fertilized it after the eggs were laid and of course coral showing spawning so this is spawn right? so spawn are basically uh, eggs and sperm deposited into the water column but, you know, since our focus really is on uh, corals, I thought, let's do a quick biology 101 on the coral story. So, you know, in nature, right, the, the primal urge to reproduce is universal. Every animal does it. For the coral, for it to make a completely new and genetically different offspring, they have to undergo a few basic steps. So this is basically the life cycle of a coral. So it starts with the gametes, which are the sperm and eggs, being produced within the coral animal itself. Each of this coral animal is called a polyp, and these polyps live within a clonal and a colony. So if you look at this photo here, right? So this is equivalent to a branch that's here, and each of these little things sticking out will be the same. Like each of these are your individual coral animal. The polyp with the skeleton around it is called a corallite. And what you see in here, these little pink dots, they are actually your sperm egg bundles that are produced by individual corals here. So once they produce it and it's ready to be released, they spawn, which is what we discussed in the previous uh, slide. So they spawn and release the sperm and egg into the water column. Within the water column, the sperm and the egg, they meet, they fertilize, and as a normal process, they fertilize and they start growing, and they grow into what we call a baby coral, a planulae. So we call it a planulae. So it looks something like this. So it looks like a little grain of rice, brown grain of rice. And this planulae will float around in the water until it's, it finds a place to settle. Now, uh, we know from, science, from research that's been done by scientists that um, the period that these planulae stay in the water can range anywhere from uh, two days to several months they've been recorded. And during this phase where they are floating around and they have the ability to settle, it's called the competent stage. So basically, they are competent planulae ability to settle down if they find the right place. And if they do, this is what happens. So if they find the right place, so you look at this photo here, uh, this is done by Richard Ross. Uh, this is a planulae, and this is after it settles down, it will start to then uh, take in calcium surroundings, and then it will deposit a skeleton. And once it deposits a skeleton, so this is your first polyp, and then it will start to bud in a asexual reproductive mode to start forming a colony. And after perhaps a year or two, it might form a colony that looks like this. So that's your coral story. That's how corals reproduce. Now, you know, you might think it sounds very, very simple. After all, one of the simplest animals in the animal kingdom. But can you imagine the challenge it presents for immobile appendageless animals? How do they do it? How do they reproduce and become so successful when they really have no way to uh, move or to detect what's happening in the environment? Well, to answer that, we need to understand a bit about coral sexuality. Now, um, you know, for some people, when you see a coral, they just think it's a boring old rock. And um, it can be, right? You know, when you look at a coral, it is just basically a, a brown rock in the, in the seabed. But they actually have very, very interesting private lives. And these corals, they actually practice two modes of sexuality. So the first one, they can be hermaphrodites. Basically, they are individuals that have both male and female gametes that produce both male and female gametes. So if you look at this photo here, this photo on the right here, this is uh, this species of coral. You can see it releasing both sperm and eggs into the water. And how do you tell? Eggs are usually larger. So you can see individual pink dots. You can literally see the dots, right? 
each dot is an egg. Sperm are much smaller, so when they release sperm, it just looks like a cloud, a white cloud that comes in. So this species, it releases both sperm and egg at the same time into the water when it is spawning. This species here, uh, as well as many others, instead of releasing individual sperm, individual egg and a sperm mist, what it does is it groups them into little bundles. So each of these pink uh, round blobs you see here is not an egg. Each of this is actually a bundle of eggs and sperm, perhaps hundreds of eggs and maybe millions of sperm in sperm sacs. And they are released as a bundle uh, surrounded by a membrane and then they float to the surface of the water. The membrane dissociates, sperm and eggs are released, fertilization can occur. So this is one of the uh, modes that they have. The other one is a gonochoric coral. So these are corals that either produce male or female. So in this particular species, the same species if you look at this photo. So on the one on this side here on the right, you can see a blurry picture, right? That's basically because it just uh, shot out a whole bunch of sperm, right? So it's a white cloud in the water. And the one on the left, you can actually see the individual eggs being released by so two modes, you're either a hermaphrodite or you're a gonochorus. So this is the, the two modes of sexuality that corals have. So, okay, you produce all the gametes. The next step is what we discussed earlier is the spawning process. And it, it can occur in two ways. So essentially for some corals, uh, they're what you call brooders, right? So brooders, they actually keep the eggs within the polyp itself. And then the sperm is released into the water, the sperm, fertilizes the egg within the polyp itself, and then the planula is produced within the polyp. When it's mature, it's actually released into the water column, complete with the zooxanthellae, which is the photosynthetic uh, algae that lives within the coral that helps it to photosynthesize and provide it with energy. So these competent planulae that come out, they are ready to settle, and many of them will settle quite near the parent colony that's released from. The next mode is broadcasters, which is basically uh, the focus of today's uh, presentation. So broadcasting corals will then release sperm and egg into the water, like we discussed in the previous slide, either uh, separately or as bundles. Now, we know that brooders may breed more than once a year. Uh, there's a particular species uh, called Pocillopora acuta, and um, I think there was research done by Dr. Beverly Go, which is doing a PhD, and it spawn almost every month. So it produces annually every month. And of course, uh, we have the broadcasters. And in between, they, they, there are others that might practice a bit of each. So uh, although generally the pattern is either brooders versus broadcasters, there are, of course, uh, a spectrum within the coral world where some practice uh, a bit of each. They are quite flexible animals. Now, interestingly, prior to 1984, scientists thought that most corals are brooders. Right? But then, of course, mass spawning was discovered. And after that, they documented the different species of corals. And from all the species that have been uh, recorded so far, in this uh, slide, it shows 349. It's probably more by now. Almost 90% of these uh, documented species are actually broadcasters. So broadcast spawning is really a major strategy used by corals to reproduce. But after finding out that, scientists at that time also thought that mass coral spawning probably cannot occur in equatorial reefs. Equatorial reefs would be reefs like those in Singapore, uh, in Tioma, you know, those along the equator. The reason being they hypothesize that uh, equatorial reefs do not experience the large environmental fluctuations compared to reefs located higher up in the latitude. So they thought, okay, uh, mass coral spawning will only occur in, uh, in waters that experience uh, more dramatic environmental changes. Now, this actually stood, this thinking actually stood in the early 2000s until a PhD student by the name of uh, James Guest is from the UK. Uh, now he's Dr. James Guest, of course. He decided to investigate this phenomenon on tropical reefs. And in the process, he debunked the thinking by documenting the occurrence of mass coral spawning, also known by its more complicated technical twin, multi specific synchronous coral spawning on equatorial reefs right here in Singapore in, in 2002. And this was the, it wasn't a paper, it was more of a report that he published in the journal Coral Reefs in which he, documents, uh, like I mentioned, multi-specific spawning of corals in Singapore for the first time. But I think more importantly, um, his work demonstrated that this remarkable phenomenon can occur in equatorial coral reefs. Then since then, of course, James went on to uh, observe this and many other equatorial reefs. He, he, 
went to the Red Sea, you documented mass corals spawning for the first time in the Red Sea, for the first time in Malaysia with our Malaysian colleagues. And he also went on to focus on various aspects of coral biology, including disease, reproduction, larval ecology, recruitment dynamics. Now, uh, very, very interesting. In fact, the latest paper that came out is this one here, completing the life cycle of broadcast spawning corals in a closed mesoplasm. The wealth of knowledge that um, this group of scientists have accumulated over the last uh, close to two decades have resulted um, in a state now where they can actually spawn corals in captivity following natural cycles that the corals experience uh, on the reef that they were uh, taken from. So uh, there was an experiment that went on and they, they took corals from Singapore and corals from uh, Australia. Singapore corals spawn earlier in the year, Australian corals spawn later in the year. They managed to set up a system where they could get the corals to spawn around the same time as they spawn in Singapore, on Singapore reefs, in an aquarium in the UK, and they spawn at the same time. Similarly, they managed to do that for corals in uh, Australia, all because they understood the environmental conditions necessary for reproduction to occur. Very, very exciting work. We are going to be working with them to see how we can do that. Now, some people might think, why are we doing all of these, right? Is it really necessary? Well, if you look at what's happening in the world today, bleaching events that are occurring everywhere, mass die-off of corals, this ability to grow corals or co complete the whole life cycle in, in uh, aquarium might actually prove to be one of the strategies to ensure that we can repopulate the reefs that are damaged by, you know, uh, multiple events, whether it's climate change or anthropogenic. So really important work has been done. If you're interested to read more about it, this link here uh, has all his I believe my colleagues will also be sharing this link in the YouTube channel. Now, I've been incredibly privileged to have been around the time when James actually started doing his PhD. And I had the opportunity to join him for those first few surveys back in 2002, where we dived on the reefs of Pulau Satung for eight consecutive nights to document spawning. You know, those were, at least to me, those are the good old days of field research. So my colleagues, you know, who were there at the time, I, I guess they were, I, I hope they would agree with me. Uh, it was a time when we used to camp out like this in a, we used to rough it out. We set up our own version of a pop-up field station. So we had a uh, complete with a, a compressor to charge our own tanks. You know, we had our dive gear, we had our little research station. We had uh, a lot of interns who helped us to charge the tanks and to make sure things can done. We camped out. And at night, you know, we have beautiful sunset uh, to appreciate our beer clock. So those are the good old days of um, field research, slightly different now with uh, all the health and safety issues. But still, you know, uh, those are the days when we actually got out to do this kind of research that paved the way to a lot of the work that's being done today. At least for me, right, the first time that I went uh, diving with James to document coral spawning, for me, I would consider my spark joy moment. What, as what Marie uh, Kondo would say, a spark joy moment. And since then, I've been hooked. You know, I've been doc uh, documenting coral spawning uh, in collaboration with different people since then, um, except for a few years when either I wasn't in Singapore, I was overseas documenting corals somewhere else, or like this year when COVID prevented us from going out into the field. So we actually missed the coral spawning event in Singapore this year. So 18 years of work and a lot of what I know about coral spawning, I learned from James and I also learned from the uh, experience we've gained over these 18 years. And I'll summarize it very quickly into four points. So the first thing is the spawning period. So we know that uh, all those spawning patterns can vary geographically between reefs separated by space. They are remarkably conserved within each reef. So although different reefs will spawn at different times of the year, within each reef, we can almost predict when they're going to spawn. So does say, for example, um, the reefs in Singapore and Tioman, we are all equatorial reefs, they're quite near the equator, but our spawning period is slightly different. In, in Singapore, uh, we find that they spawn about, um, they spawning peaks about three to six days after the full moon following the March equinox. If you look at this picture here, so we take the March equinox or the vernal equinox as our guide. We look at the full moon following the March equinox and we calculate a few days after that. That's when the corals in Singapore spawn. And Tioman responds on the full moon night itself. So if you know these kind of patterns, you can actually almost predict when the corals are going to spawn on almost any reef around the world. The next one is spawning time. So in Singapore, uh, we found that corals spawn generally between 8.30 to 10 p.m. on the reef that we 
document this morning. So to, to make sure that we can compare data over time, we go to the same reef. So the reef that we go to is a reef of Pulau Saktumu, where Raffles Lighthouse is located, about a 100 meter stretch. Uh, we go to that reef every year and we document spawning. And we find that most of the time, the corals spawn between 8.30 to 10. But there are also uh, a few exceptions. So there are dust spawners. So uh, remember the photo we talked about gonochoric corals and the corals that are producing sperm and egg at the same time as a mist and individual eggs. That coral spawns at dusk, 7.45 p.m. Usually we see the coral spawn. Um, we suspect that there might be dawn spawners, but we've never been able to stay up all night to do this. So we actually haven't documented spawning that occurs uh, in the morning, but it's possible. The next one specifically for Singapore is a spawning zone. So corals in Singapore grow up to six to eight meters uh, depth on our reefs, but we only observe shallow coral spawning on our reefs. Uh, you may ask why is that? Well, we think it's a function of energy availability, which is of course linked to light availability because we know that corals photosynthesize. If you photosynthesize, you need light. The visibility of waters on average over the year might range between uh, two to three meters. There are days that are less than one meter. There are days that are like eight meters that some of my colleagues you know, observed just a couple of weeks ago. But on average, two to three meters. If light can only penetrate two to three meters, it means uh, corals deeper down, uh, getting some light, but maybe not sufficient light to, to generate the kind of energy required to reproduce. So perhaps our deeper corals don't reproduce because there's not enough light, but they can still survive. So which means if spawning is successful in the shallow reef areas, they can populate deeper areas and they can grow. So it is still fine because it still allows the whole process of regeneration to occur across our entire coral reef zone. And the last point, spawning participation. On a normal year, not impacted by say, uh, elevated sea surface temperature, we have documented about 20 or 30 percent of a reef population spawning. Again, I caveat there saying um, because we only monitor a stretch of about 150 meters at Pula Satumu, so uh, within that stretch, almost every year about 20 or 30 percent of the corals there will spawn during the coral spawning period. There are many other interesting observations and there will be another talk in its own, things like which coral produce what color, what size of eggs. So now we can even look at the color, look at the size and try to figure out which coral is actually spawning. But that will be a topic for another time. But you know, I'm talking about all of this and you're probably wondering, right, you know, what, what does it actually look like? It's, it's not easy to visualize coral spawning if you have never seen it yourself. So what I've done to help you visualize is I've composed a poem. Uh, it was one of those moments, you know, you come out from a dive and you're so inspired and you write a poem. So it kind of started off like that. Uh, and this poem chronicles the spawning event in Singapore. And I've set it to music and visuals. Um, I hope with this video, it gives you an immersive experience of what coral spawning is and maybe even inspire you to take up scuba diving if you're not already a diver and maybe even arrange to catch a spawning event on a reef somewhere around the world after this whole COVID situation goes over. I hope you enjoy it and this is how it goes. Just around Easter time, all across our reefs, critters start stirring, anticipating an event so brief. Because every year on our reefs, just about this time, nature has determined and the moon, she inclines. To welcome an event, simple but profound, where corals partake in an event that astounds. For when the conditions are right and the moon just off her prime, the seas explode life, guided by some internal chime. For the corals have labored over octopal moons, building their future within little pink balloons. They gather their seeds and slowly construct little bundles of life just waiting to erupt. And they patiently wait while their bundles mature 
for that right moment where success ensures. To give their offsprings every chance to survive in a tumultuous sea to grow and to thrive. And as the moon fades and the tides, they recede. The polyps inflate and release their seeds. In a synchrony of life, unrivaled in skill, they shroud their surrounds in pulsating pink veils. The fish and the sea stars, the clams and the crabs, feast on this bounty, a gift to be had. Yet, despite life's first test, the gauntlet of mouse, the seeds they float on to fertilize and sprout. And then, when they find their perfect reef shore, their tiny being settle and a new chapter unfolds. For that is life in its simplest of forms, to live and let live life's only present storms. These stars of the night they cannot be found in palaces or playgrounds or within common surrounds. And but for a brief moment can we behold such displays of frenzy as life simply unfolds. So sit back and marvel Relish the show as the corals they spawn in reverse pink snow. It's a beautiful night, declares Mr. Bruno Mars. So ladies and fellas, if you please, introducing our spawn stars. Right, I hope you enjoyed that poem and the visuals that accompanied it as much as I enjoyed preparing it for you. I would like to give a big shout out to my uh, colleague, Serena, who kindly offered her voice to narrate the poem. I think it's beautiful. She sounds beautiful. All right. Well, we're coming towards the end of the presentation and I will end the presentation on coral spawning by highlighting why broadcast spawning is actually important for coral reef survival. So firstly, the strategy of broadcast spawning ensures predator saturation. Now with so many gametes released in such a short time, predators can only eat a small portion of this bounty, allowing many of them to continue on their journey to fertilize and sprout. Secondly, the sheer number of gametes in the water column also increases the chance of fertilization success. Um, there's higher chance that a male and female gametes of the same species will meet and fertilize in such a vast ocean surface if there's mass coral spawning. Now this increases the overall reproduction success. Um, however, we also know that, oops. however, we also know that um, if corals spawn out of sync, or, or in, if species spawn out of sync by just a few minutes, they could actually miss the entire chance of uh, reproduction. Just a minute, switch on video. Sorry. Okay, I apologize. My video was off. <laughs> I wasn't trying to hide from anyone <laughs> because I'm sweating. Um, thirdly, mass uh, squirrel spawning also increases the chance of genetic diversity. Now, when you have so many individuals of a species spawning simultaneously, there's a greater possibility that many gen different genetic combinations of a single species may form adding to the increased genetic diversity of that species. Now, of course, uh, with genetic diversity, you also increases the chance of resilience. 
Um, so there's a greater chance that of all the different genetic combinations that are produced of a particular species, some of them might be able to withstand some of the environmental uh, challenges like say uh, elevated sea surface temperature. So if you look at this photo over here, you can see this is a bleaching event that occurred, if I'm not wrong, in 2016. And you can see some corals bleach and some corals don't bleach. Some corals bleach a bit. So the question is, why? Why do some corals bleach and why, uh, why do some corals, uh, how why are some corals able to withstand the elevated sea surface temperature? If we can answer that question and find out why, then we have a chance to ensure that the resilient corals continue to reproduce so that uh, down the line, because we're expecting climate change to continue, sea surface temperature to con continue to rise, you will have hardier corals to repopulate reefs down the line. And mass coral spawning is an important event that allows this to happen. And of course, lastly, broadcast spawning increases a coral's dispersal range. Um, the planulae that's in the water column, it's really at the mercy of uh, the currents. You take, can take them far and wide. And if you're lucky, they end up in a place where the uh, environmental conditions are suitable. There's a place for them to settle and you can settle and repopulate new favorable areas. So all in all, um, as a strategy, broadcast spawning is really important. And if you think about it, right, corals have occurred for so many uh, tens of thousands of years. I can't remember the actual number, which I should, but I forgot. Uh, if you need to know, I will you'll check it up and I'll give you the number. But they've, just, they've been around for so long and they're the simplest of animals, right? They basically just a stomach with little arms in the, in the air that filters water or photosynthesize. Yet they have been able to populate almost all equatorial region for tens of thousands of years. And possibly broadcast spawning was a strategy that allowed them to increase their range and continue to uh, populate areas over and over again. So a very, very important strategy for coral and coral reef survival. Now, having learned more about mass coral spawning even in Singapore and why it's important, right? Some of you may be asking now, what is NPARC doing to ensure that such events can continue to occur on a regular basis? In essence, how does NPARC's broader conservation strategy help in our coral reef uh, conservation efforts so that they can continue and flourish and continue to spawn? Well, to answer that question, we actually have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture, the Nature Conservation Master Plan. Oh, I'm just going to take a minute break. I'm just wondering, is, is there a problem with the video? Because I, I keep getting a message to say turn on the video and my video is on. The video is working fine right now. Okay, great. I'll just continue then. Yeah. Sorry, the technology, right? They keep, they keep popping up with all these things and wondering what's happening. It's all right. Okay, so answer the question. Um, we look at the big picture, the Nature Conservation Master Plan, which was uh, a plan launched in 2015, and it charts the course of Singapore's conservation journey, both now and in the future. The Nature Conservation Master Plan aims to systematically consolidate, coordinate, strengthen, and intensify biodiversity conservation efforts outlined in the broader National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan which a lot of countries have. So this is Singapore specific one. And it focuses on four main thrust, conservation of key habitats, habitat enhancement, restoration and species recovery, applied research and conservation, biology and planning. And lastly, and to me, one of the most important thrust, community stewardship and outreach in nature. So this is the overall plan. Then to help in the marine conservation area, we have the Marine Conservation Action Plan, which was also launched in 20. 15, and it takes reference from the Nature Conservation Master Plan, and it generally encapsulates NPARC's effort at conserving Singapore's marine biodiversity. We have the four similar thrusts. So the first one, conserving key habitats, and in that uh, picture there, you will see Sisters Island Marine Park, which is Singapore's first marine park that was uh, announced in 2014. Um, for those who haven't been there, you know, uh, it's a beautiful place. You can go now, it's very, very rustic. But in a few years time, uh, Big Sisters Island will transform into a place where visitors can go, not just to enjoy a nice tropical day out, you know, on an island with sun, sand and sea, but also to learn more about Singapore's marine environment through various educational facilities that will be uh, implemented there, including things like floating biodiversity boardwalks, intertidal pools, forest trails, and coastal tree conservation area. So uh, keep that in mind. In a few years time, Sisters Island will be a fantastic place for you to go and learn more about marine biodiversity. 
for supporting that, we also have habitat enhancement, restoration, and species recovery programs um, done in-house or together with our uh, partners from the universities. Research and monitoring, it's really the pillar of uh, what we do. Um, everything we do needs to be science-based. We need, it needs to be science and evidence-based. So we work very closely with our academic partners to help us answer some of these questions so that they can be applied to conservation on the ground. And lastly, we have outreach and education, which again, like I mentioned before, is really an important pillar um, where we reach out to the community through uh, various groups, like say the Friends of the Marine Park community, which has very strong citizen science slant. So um, these are the ways we try our best uh, to ensure that marine conservation can be ensured for the long-term success of our coastal marine habitats. So that, you know, the next generation and generations following that will always be able to enjoy our marine environment. Now, if hopefully some of you have been inspired and you might be wondering to yourself, okay, I'm interested, how do I get me some of this biodiversity action? Well, you come to the right place. So over the years, you know, NPARCS has created and curated many activities and opportunities for interested members of the public, not, on, not only to learn more about Singapore's amazing natural environment and biodiversity, but also opportunities to get involved and be part of this growing citizen science movement. For those of you who have attended the previous NPARC Spotlight series uh, by my colleagues, given by my colleagues, you'll be aware that of the myriad of activities and opportunities which they shared in their presentation. And you know, since I'm aware my half an hour is uh, kind of up now, um, instead of repeating what they have mentioned, I'm giving you the links here. And I believe my colleagues will also be sharing the links on the YouTube channel. So go and listen to their talks. In their talks, they talk about all the various activities and opportunities that members of public can take part in. And hopefully with that, you will join us in more of our activities. And so I will end here with a little reminder by one of the most beloved ocean advocate, Dr. Sylvia Earle, on why efforts to protect our planet's blue lungs is so important, not just for the marine environment, but for the entire planet. Because, you know, um, no blue, no green. We will not be here without our marine environment. So with that, thank you for joining the session. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I will uh, give the screen back to Les. Leslie, all yours. Let me uh, stop sharing. Thank you, Karen. That was a splendid sharing. I think all of us really enjoyed the poem, which I have to remind everybody was written by Karen herself and the stunning footage as well. She filmed it by herself all over many, many years. So uh, I think we'll move on with the q and I've got a lot of questions and we'll try to get through as many as we can. So the first question is, how many species of corals do we have in Singapore? Great question. Um, if you read a lot of the publications, we always say uh, we have recorded uh, 255 species of corals in Singapore. That is basically the number of species that have been recorded um, all the way from the 60s and 70s. So these are all the species that have been recorded. But uh, if you go to a reef in Singapore, uh, a reef that is you know, pretty diverse, uh, on average, uh, we think that you might get between 100, 150, 180 species. Uh, so will we find all these species again? We are hoping we can, so we are going out to do monitoring. Uh, there's also the chance that there are more species that are present but haven't been documented. So literature, 255, you go on a reef, 100, 150 most of the time, with possibility of new species being recorded. Okay, so 255 recorded species, but then again, there's always more to discover out there. Next question. What is your favorite coral? I remember uh, my colleague Jeffrey Lowe trying to answer that question of what was his favorite fish. <laughs> um, again, you know, it's very hard to say what's your favorite. Uh, they're all, they're all unique, they're all special, right? Uh, but the coral, I won't say favorite because I love it, but because I'm still in the quest to find it again. There's this particular species called uh, Stylophora pistillata that uh, we recorded in Singapore a long time ago in the uh, 80s, 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, when you know, uh, my mentor, Professor Chow, and his team were surveying, it was recorded then. Then we couldn't find it for the longest time, it just didn't exist, right? So since I started diving, I have never seen the coral in Singapore. In 20, 2006, in one of the dives at Pulau Satumu, there was this one colony, quite small, uh, probably about 20 centimeter, you know, in size. So excited, right, you know, went back and monitored the coral for years after that, and it grew. So by, 20, uh, by 2010, right, the coral became about four times, increased four times its volumetric size, pretty large. Um, we were thinking about doing some restoration program, but we haven't started 
And then in 20, 20, 2010, the um, bleaching occurred. When the bleaching occurred, that coral bleached and that coral died, and then it disappeared. So we had from 255, we actually had 256 at one time and went back to 255 species because that individual disappeared. Right? Um, again, pointing to the fact that um, they, we might have a lot of species, but not everyone is in the condition where, you know, uh, they can thrive. So we need to then come in to do restoration programs. And that's why NPARCS is now embarking very strongly on species recovery. If we find an individual or some corals that are rare in Singapore, only found in one place or in a few places, we're going to try to reproduce these corals through fragmentation uh, as a first step because we can increase the number of corals uh, much faster through fragmentation. They become clones of each other, but at least you increase the number and reproduce then reproduction. So Stylophora distillata. Thank you. Next. Okay. Thank you. And thanks for sharing that, that, that story about um, this particular species of, of coral. So I'm sure your team will work hard to conserve not just this one species, but other, other species that we have in our waters as well. Next question. Where can we find coral reefs in Singapore? Right. Okay. So to understand that, and, and I think this is a very good question because um, to answer this question, right, you will be able to then find coral reefs anywhere around the world. So what do coral reefs need to survive? So most reefs require temperatures ranging between 18 to uh, 30, 31 degrees. So basically you can find coral reefs in the, uh, the belt between 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Uh, so, so that's one condition. It requires uh, enough sunlight. It requires uh, waters that have enough nutrients. Um, it also requires uh, some like this uh, good salinity, so it cannot thrive in, it cannot survive in waters that are too, uh, that have too much fresh water. So, es so estuarine water, fresh water, they don't survive. So if you know all of this, then you'll know that coral reefs can be found in almost um, any coastal areas that has a, a, a shallow reef where corals can uh, settle on. So in Singapore, we find that in the south of Singapore, because if you go north, the water becomes a bit less saline, right? You have a bit more uh, influence from rivers that are coming down, so you get, uh, lower saline waters. Some coral, resilient corals might survive there, but in general, they may not form reefs there. So you want to find coral reefs in Singapore, you go to the south. Um, the only area that you'll find it uh, south of Singapore, mainland would be along uh, Labrador Nature Reserve. So that's the last stretch of our natural coastline. You'll find a small stretch of coral reef there. But if you go to the southern islands, they surround most of our southern islands and the patch reefs that are situated within the waters of Singapore. Okay, so when it comes to coral reefs, it's not so much about like specific location boundaries, but you need to understand um, whether the conditions of an area are suitable. So there's the water temperature, the nutrients, and also the availability of sunlight. But in Singapore, a good place would be the waters surrounding our southern islands and Labrador Nature Reserve. Okay, moving on. Can we observe coral spawning in the wild in Singapore? Well, you saw the video, right? You can observe coral spawning in the wild in Singapore. Again, um, with the wealth of knowledge that has been accumulated over the last 18 years by so many research groups doing, uh, we can almost pinpoint where we can find, uh, we, we can predict corals to spawn. Um, and to add to that, you know, I, I know a lot of people are interested. Uh, two years ago, we had a group from the Hantu bloggers who asked us, you know, uh, can we go and observe coral spawning at Pula Hantu? So we worked with them. So they actually observed coral spawning at Pula Hantu while we did the work at Pula Satunu. So, if they spawn in one reef, in very uh, high likelihood, they will spawn in all the reefs in Singapore, as long as the corals are healthy enough to reproduce over the, uh, the period where the sperms and eggs are produced, the pluripogenesis period, uh, and if there's avail enough energy available to produce it, it will spawn during the appropriate time. So yes, you can observe coral spawning in the wild in Singapore. Okay, thank you. We're moving on to the next question. Why does coral bleaching occur? Oh, okay, uh, very, very good question. Um, it's a very sad event, you know, to see coral bleaching. The first time uh, we saw coral bleaching in Singapore, I was still working at uh, NUS with Professor Chow and his team. It was in 1998 um, when we went out to do monitoring. And then as we approached the reef, we saw white, you know, and we like, why, why is the reef looking so white? You know, and that's the first time we saw coral bleaching, and that was 1998, where very little information was uh, known about coral bleaching and what triggers it. But over the last uh, few decades, uh, we realized that corals are actually very sensitive animals. They have been successful. They've been uh, thriving for 
tens of thousands of years, right? You know, uh, the most simple animals and they've been able to colonize almost every area, but yet they survive within very narrow environmental range. And one of the uh, things that can impact them is temperature, sea surface temperature. So I mentioned before, right, corals uh, ideally survive between 18 degrees to about 31 degrees. But if you look at what's happening now with climate change, right, um, whatever happens in the air, of course, it, it uh, uh, goes down to the sea also, and sea surface temperatures also rise. So if it exceeds the temperature at which corals uh, uh, op optimally survive, then one of the stress response of it is to release the zooxanthellae that lives inside them. And that process turns a coral white because what you're looking at is actually the white calcium carbonate skeleton through the translucent tissue of the coral. So corals bleach when the environmental conditions become uh, challenging. So um, the most obvious one, of course, is sea surface temperature because that occurs at the uh, regional or global level, right? Because across, so you see it most obviously, but it can also bleach because of uh, chemical stress of so there, say a, a chemical spill, they can, you know, they can bleach because of that. So there are acute stresses that can cause corals to bleach, but what we usually observe, um, bleaching brought about by elevated sea surface temperature events. Okay, so coral bleaching, as Karen explained, is the release of zooxanthellae, which are like single-celled organisms that live in the coral and give it its color. So how it can occur is, um, there are a few different factors that can cause it. So um, Karen mentioned there could be chemical stresses, but a common one is uh, sea, the change in sea surface temperature, which makes corals particularly vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Okay, the next question that we have, how does coral bleaching affect spawning rates? Hmm, very interesting question. Uh, in fact, I say interesting question because um, Recently, one of our research collaborators, uh, Dr. Huang Danwei, sent me a paper uh, that was just published, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in August, that talked about how bleaching affects long-term uh, reproduction in corals. Um, let me send that link to Leslie, and Leslie can then share it uh, uh, with you guys. So basically, um, this research showed that coral bleaching can affect the reproductive ability of uh, the coral in years to come even. Um, again, and, and that, that's similar to what I mentioned before, like light availability. If there's not enough energy, right, you cannot invest the energy into reproduction. So if you're an animal and you want to survive, what's the first thing you do, right? You will save all your energy to survive. Reproduction is not your first priority if the energy you need is to survive. If you have excess energy, then you then translate the energy to reproduction. So um, when you have beach corals, when they, when they bleach and they start to recover, the amount of energy they may receive may not be sufficient for them to go through their whole chemicogenesis cycle. And then they may not reproduce. They might reproduce maybe three, four years down the line as the coral recovers and builds up the energy resource. Um, so coral bleaching can have an effect. Uh, the scary thing is coral bleaching is occurring at a rate that is unprecedented, right? Um, when coral bleaching first occurred in 1998, when we first documented that on a global scale. They were saying uh, it's linked to El Nino, and El Nino at that time, uh, the understanding was it occurs every 20 years, 30 years. But then after 1998, the next bleaching event was in 2010. Then the next bleaching event was in 2016. Then the next bleaching event just occurred. So what we're seeing is a reduction in the um, time between spawning events. If coral needs about five, six years to fully recover, from a bleaching event to be able to reproduce fully, then we are talking about um, sea surface temperature events that are occurring more frequently, causing corals to bleach more frequently. So they just never have the ability to get back to the level where they can reproduce maximally. So we are concerned about that. And that's why the research on uh, resilient corals are important because it helps us to um, find ways to ensure that we can um, grow corals that are resilient to increasing sea surface temperature so that they're not impacted by that, and then they can continue to reproduce. I hope I answered the question. Okay, so spawning needs energy, so bleaching definitely has an impact. And at the rate at which bleaching is occurring right now, um, there, there is an even more pressing need to understand this and how we can um, ensure that the corals can recover. And I think my colleague Nigel just shared the link to the paper which Karen mentioned, if anybody is interested to find out more. Okay, the next question is, how are other animals like sea turtles affected by coral bleaching? 
Very, very interesting question. Now, and that, that's a big picture question, right? Um, the thing about uh, doing research when you study a particular animal, you tend to get focused on that animal, right? But we must always remember that these animals do not occur in isolation. They are part of a larger ecosystem. Whatever happens to an ecosystem affects every single animal that depend on that ecosystem. So when coral bleaching occurs, it affects the corals, corals bleach. But when corals bleach, animals that depend on the corals are also affected. So animals that live within the corals, animals that feed on the corals um, are affected by it. And if something major occurs, like a phase shift in the coral community it goes from, say, a, a reef with you know, your animals like sponges and, and uh, sea stars and all that, to a reef that's, say, covered in algae because you all the corals are dead. We know that sea turtles like uh, oxbill feed on sponges, then they may not actually be able to survive on the reef. There's not enough food on that reef. It may not occur immediately. So these are uh, long-term processes that occur that impact uh, the entire food web within a particular environment. So coral beaching as a process, uh, it's sad to see. It's really you know something that we're trying to address, but its impact on the entire ecosystem is something that we're very worried about. Um, and efforts to protect individual species, but as well as protect entire ecosystem need to come hand in hand. We can't do one without the other. We must focus on habitat conservation, the first trust of our nature conservation master plan, as well as species recovery to make sure that those that need a bit of help get that help. At the same time, making sure that environment they depend on is uh, in a condition that can support the entire biodiversity within the area. That's a pretty long story to answer a very short question. Okay, I think Karen highlighted a few key points. Um, yes, there are many other animals that depend on corals, whether it's for food or as a habitat. So when it comes to conservation, you have to consider like the whole ecosystem. You can't look at just one thing in isolation. And likewise, we also have to consider how our impact as humans will affect uh, these habitats and species. So the next question, what resources would you recommend to study or learn more about corals in Singapore? Um, I assume that question is coming from a member of public. Uh, so if you're interested to learn more about uh, coral, coral reefs uh, and some of the other work that's being done, there's so many opportunities, right? So again, I encourage you to go and listen to the uh, other talks given by my colleagues because at the end of their talk, they list out all the various activities that you can uh, uh, join to learn more about it. But um, also know that there are other groups that are doing it. So we have the St. John's Island Marine Lab, uh, a very important partner to us, you know, and they have an outreach and education program. Um, within the facility at the St. John's Island Marine Lab, you have the Marine Park Outreach and Education Center. Um, in fact, uh, we just learned today, so quite a lot of people are already at the Outreach and Education Center. There you can actually learn about uh, the conservation work that's being done. And we also have tanks outside, you know, where you can go and look at uh, the various animals that you'll find in the reef um, and some of the research that's going on. And if you're still inspired after that and want to do something, um, there are opportunities to volunteer. Uh, there's volunteer programs that will, you can help in, say, documenting intertidal areas in Singapore. We have the Intertidal Watch Program that's uh, coordinated by my colleague, Perong, and uh, she takes people out. I think she's trained more than uh, 350 members of public, and they go out to four or five areas uh, within Singapore's uh, intertidal areas in, I think, Pasir Ris, uh, Changi Beach. Uh, I can't remember the other two. So uh, if you want the information in the, in the slides that my uh, colleagues have presented. So there are opportunities for you all to go out. So what I suggest is go out and take part, right? The first thing you want to do is go and learn about it. Go and take part in these guided walks. You can go on your own. But if you don't know what you're looking at, that uh, understanding is not there. So join one of these guided walks. After that, if you're excited, you can then become a guide. So you can uh, learn from the guides to, to teach other people about the marine environment. And if you like it even more, then you can actually help out researchers doing some of the research, collect data, submit the data. There was a paper that was published, I think, uh, a few months ago, um, looking at the community of uh, intertidal animals in data collected by citizen scientists, uh, and, and that's the work done by Ria Tan um, and all the volunteers that go out with a, a fantastic paper. So citizen, the regular guy on the street, your citizen scientist can contribute to data that scientists can use to understand the environment better and what management agencies and NPARCs can do to protect them based on the data that comes in. Hope I okay. 
So <laughs> there are a variety of programs you can take part in. I think earlier during the session, my colleague Nigel shared us a set of links. You can check out the volunteer programs offered by N Parks. Okay, so finally, Karen, what is one surprising thing about coral reefs that you have found during your work with NDC? Okay, just unmuted myself. Um, you know, I've been working on coral reefs for the last uh, 30 years. I just, uh, you know, now you know how old I am. Uh, you know, um, despite that, and I've been all over the region. Uh, I've been to Australia, uh, Micronesia, all, all across uh, the region. No, not all over the world diving, but in, in a lot of places in the world diving. But after going to this place, I love it. Clear waters, beautiful, you know, beautiful species. You know, you see a lot of things. I'm always excited to come back to dive on our reef. You know, there's something special about the reefs in Singapore. You always find something new. Um, just like that species that you know, uh, we found in 2006 and then disappeared. You know, we're still looking for it. We went I always make it a point to go back and look for it. Still haven't found it yet, but you know, you never know. You might, you might find it. Um, I, I think that our reefs are always surprising. Um, you know the slogan "surprising Singapore," but you know, I think our reefs uh, are really one of those uh, hidden gems in Singapore that provides uh, just continuous uh, wonder to the people who go out. And, and I know I speak for a lot of people uh, who go diving. A lot of our volunteers who join us for the work we do. Um, you never get bored of going to our reefs and to look at what's there. Even if it was the same thing, you know, you see how a particular coral has grown, you know, you'll see a, a coral that was impacted by bleaching but it's recovering. These are all exciting things. So I won't say there's one thing. What I'll say is uh, our environment is really amazing. Um, maybe COVID is a perfect opportunity for everyone to then introspect a bit, you know, instead of going out to the rest of the world to look at uh, the environment there, introspect come and visit our natural areas and you'll be surprised how much we have and how amazing our environment is. And if you are surprised and amazed by that, then you'll join us in our efforts to conserve these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I think uh, not, not just for you, but across all the other NPARC Spotlight talks as well, our speakers do talk about how nature consistently surprises us, even till today. So, for our audience as well, I hope Karen's talk has piqued your interest about our flora and fauna. And even though we may not always be able to see it, there is biodiversity among us and we can play a part to protect it. Karen has mentioned a few of our strategies and plans and these all come under the Nature Conservation Master Plan, which is our systematic approach to conserving our biodiversity and transforming Singapore into a city in nature. The, uh, for more information, you can check out the first NPARC Spotlight talk on YouTube. In it, our group director, Lim Liang Jim, outlines this ma master plan. And we have just shared a few more links with you in the chat as well. On our YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of all our previous sessions for you to gain insights into the biodiversity around us. And if you enjoy them, please share them with your family and friends. Next Saturday, we are very excited to feature our first speaker from the Singapore Botanic Gardens Division, Zestin So presenting Befriending the Bees. You may think of bees as striped yellow insects that produce honey and pollinate our food crops. But did you know that we have over a hundred species of bees in Singapore? And they can come in a, in a vibrant array of colors, not just yellow, such as one example that's being shown on my slide. And aside from playing a key role in ensuring a stable food supply, they're also critical to the health of our local forests. Do register to join us on Zoom, or you can stream the talk live on our YouTube channel. The registration link will be shared in the chat soon. And with that, I'd like to thank Karen for the session and for our audience on both Zoom and YouTube for being with us today. We'd love to hear your feedback, so please scan the QR code on my screen. We have more exciting events and activities on biodiversity, gardening, pets, and more. Something for everyone. So don't forget to connect with us on social media for the latest updates. Just this afternoon, there'll be an e-Pets Day Out event on Facebook Live at 3 p.m. So do tune into that if you're interested. And for everybody else, I wish you a great weekend. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>